So welcome to the 2022 Women's Leadership Initiative event. Um, for those who've just joined us, uh, there was some of us participating in a network event and thank you to all of those who joined for that. That was um, some interesting conversation and I really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Willow Fuchs and I am one of the co-chairs uh, of the Council on the Status of Women and I'm a librarian here at the university. So this initiative uh, takes shape as an annual collaborative event, typically on the Friday before International Women's Day. And it's hosted by the University of Iowa D Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and the Iowa M Women's Leadership Network, the Women's Resor Resource and Action Center and the Council on the Status of Women. Um, we recognize the need for more women leaders at all levels of higher education across the state of Iowa. Thus, the Women's Leadership Initiative was developed by Women for Women. The focus of this initiative is to create a community of support for the empowerment of women leaders. Presentations and conversations are led by esteemed and engaged women leaders with connections to Iowa. Women working in or with colleges or universities have the opportunity to learn from each other in a supportive community about topics of impact for women in leadership. Okay, so before we start today's conversation, I wanna recognize indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of this land. It is important that we understand the long-standing history that has brought us to reside on this land and to strive to understand our place within this history. As a first step, I will read a land acknowledgement created by the Native American Council. The University of Iowa is located on the homelands of the Chippewa, Iowa, Kickapoo, Menominee, Miami, Missouri, Omaha, Osage, Oto, Ottawa, Ponca, Potawatomi, Sac and Fox, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, three affiliated tribes, and Winnebago nations. The following tribal nations, Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Sac and Fox of the Mississippi and Iowa, and Winnebago Tribes of Nebraska continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories, territories of these tribal nations. The treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. Consistent with the university's com commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, understanding the historical and current experiences of native peoples will help inform the work we do. Collectively, as a university to engage in building relationships through academic scholarship, collaborative partnerships, community service, and enrollment and retention efforts, acknowledging our past, our present, and future Native nations. Again, I want to acknowledge and thank the University of Iowa's Native American Council for creating this land acknowledgement. So this year, we have the pleasure of not one, but two women joining us in conversation. So Teal Gonzalez has an MFA from the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, where she was an Iowa Arts Fellow and recipient of the Michener Copernicus Prize in Fiction. She was the winner of the 2019 Disquiet Literary Prize, and her work has been published on Bustle, Vogue, and The Cut. She's a contributor to The Atlantic, where her weekly newsletter, Brooklyn Everywhere, explores gentrification of people and places. Her New York, her New York Times bestselling debut novel, Olga Dies Dreaming, was published in January of this year by Flatiron Books. Prior to beginning her MFA, Sochil was an entrepreneur and strategic consultant for nearly 15 years. She serves on the board of the Lower East Side Girls Club. A native Brooklynite and proud public school graduate, she received her BA in, in fine art from Brown University. She lives in her hometown of Brooklyn with her, do her dog, Hector Laveau. And we also have with us Sam, sorry, Lam Samantha Chang. Her new no novel, The Family Chow, was published by W.W. Norton in February of this year. She is the author of two previous novels, All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost, and Inheritance, and a story collection, Hunger. Her short stories have appeared in The Atlantic Monthly, Plowshares, and The Best American Short Stories. She ha has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, and the American Academy in Berlin. Chang, Chang is the director of the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. She lives with her husband and daughter here in Iowa City. Welcome. So I have a question to get things started, but then we would love to just listen in on the conversation of the two of you together. So what's your relationship with the word leader and how would you describe the impact the, impact the University of Iowa Writers Workshop has had on your leadership journey? Mm. 
Man. <laughs> oh. Oh, there we Good. go. Okay, that's great. It said the host would like you to stay muted. So <laughs> no, don't stay muted, Sam. Please talk. <laughs> No, um, I feel like I've been given this tremendous opportunity here at the University of Iowa to lead an extraordinary group of writers and to be, you know, part of an amazing writing community. It's just been incredible. And um, I don't know, I wonder as, as, as graduate students, whether people feel that the university is calling upon them to lead, you know, as they're here also so chill having just graduated what do you think yeah i mean i think well i guess it's twofold i do think you know there's this thing about it being the iowa writers workshop that's sort of a big thing and i think it has a place in the publishing literary space that you're very aware of um i would say it would be underselling your leadership of how much you've changed like i like you've changed publishing in your tenure here already because it's such a pipeline to books getting seen and 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 recognized and just getting it getting read off of a pile you know is like is the, is coming from this program and i think that in the diversification of the student body here i think that has changed publishing and i feel i see that changing publishing like and 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 that is tremendous so i i feel gratitude to have been a part of that um and gratitude to you for that. But I also feel, I guess, like as a student here, I did feel a student, I guess, and a teacher, because there's this sort of teaching component, right? Like yes. I did feel a, that I wanted the work to behoove the credential, if that makes sense. Like I did, I, like, I think, you know, I don't know how to put it. You, there's a lot of mediocre people that graduate from Brown. I went to Brown. Like there's a lot of mediocre people that graduate from Brown. Like, so I, but like, then you kind of get this like door that opens for you and like, just because, um, and it makes certain things easier. And I think I, I recognize that this is this unique opportunity because it's a public college, but this very elite program within a public college. Yeah. And I wanted the work it could get published, but can the, is, it doesn't stand up to the reputation, you know? And, and so that was sort of this like thing that I guess is like a little bit in your headspace. And then for me in particular, it's like, there are not, unfortunately it's changing, but there are not enough Let Latinx writers in the literary space. You know, a lot of people are writing in genre, um, you know, in sci-fi and fantasy and romance, but like not necessarily in the kind of contemporary literary space. And so that I felt, a bit, I don't want to say the weight of it, but I felt a bit of, of pressure to write something that I felt was of quality because I wanted then the ability to be able to help amplify other voices, right? Like it's like who is coming, coming behind you. And I think I did feel a desire to connect with some of the undergraduate community, like when I was there, because you don't get enough examples of that. And actually my assistant now was an undergraduate at Iowa and we met at she came to a reading at Die House, so um, in the oh, wow. family room, and That's she so asked great. a question about where did he go, and and then I like found her afterwards, and we had coffee, and and then we you know we just stayed friends, and then when she graduated, she came on to help me with all things about the book and the show and stuff. So so I think that I did feel a bit of like, and and even as an as an instructor, that sort of like how do you be who you are in the classroom and own your own experience while making room for your students experiences and um and i was teaching on zoom you know so like you're like yes. <laughs> like you're trying to also be gentle to the challenge of that and, and so you know i think i think it's a qual in that case it's like it's a quality level but it's also like making sure that you're not i think leadership is also just not necessarily about self-centeredness right like i think it's about thinking oh. communally I think that that is the key thing. And one thing that's really wonderful is to hear how, you know, my long attempts to diversify the program have really started to sort of move into a space that has nothing to do with me. Like you, you as a student of the program have had a wide impact on your students and now with your work on many people, you know, all over the US with having a best-selling book 
Um, and I feel kind of like part of my role has been, I mean, the easiest part of my role um, as a leader coming into the workshop was to see what needed to be done. And then sort of changing the program has been a very long-term process. And I feel that in, in a very low key way, um, you know, we've changed it little by little by little by little by little, mm -hmm. and it's beginning to pay off in a major way mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. with people like you coming out of the program and making it possible for other writers, you know, or writers who are just barely starting or thinking about becoming to dream about what they want to do. It so helps them to see like a variety of people in the publishing space. I mean, I remember when I was a young writer at the program in 1991, um, we were just talking about education in the <laughs> 90s, but I mean, oh, it was wow. a very, very wow. different place. Yeah. 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 That that's, I know we, we were chatting a little bit before this about imposter syndrome, but I'm very curious how like in that era, because I had a very different experience as a graduate student 20 years, I went to my college, 20 year college reunion in May and I started the workshop in August. Oh. So, you know, like it was literally 20 years later that I went back to school and I had a very different experience with imposter syndrome at, when, at 42 versus 18, you know, like when I started undergraduate. So sure. I'm curious, like how that felt because you went, were at the workshop when you were relatively young and how that felt and I'm just, yeah. I, I mean, that's so interesting. I mean, I, I think that being at the workshop in the early 90s as a person of color and a female, um, one had to put on a kind of armor <clears throat> at all times. Like some of it was like just me protecting my space, like getting my own apartment and sort of debriefing with people that I knew had known before I came here. And part of it was, um, was, uh, you know, just um, keeping in mind that, that I was doing something important, um, that it was very important for writers like me to be at the program. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think in my year, I was the only Asian American. And then the year following me, it was Alex Chi. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I think there was one uh, black student in my program in my year. And then the following year, was there? There was one year before me. I mean, it was just very, very different. The whole place was, is, was wildly different. So there was this um, awareness of being... Um, sort of part of the program's outward facing, uh, you know, look, profile, and then also just this interior experience I was going through the whole time. I did not, however, feel like an imposter. I always felt like I had something to say. Yeah. Even when, yeah, even when my professor, who I admired and still admire, told me that he thought I should stop writing about Asian American characters. Really? I really just, yeah, I just didn't believe him. But you yeah. Know, yeah, he told me to stop because I would be pigeonholed as a writer and that I was actually a good writer. And that like if by taking on subjects that weren't um, sort of more mainstream, I would be um, pigeonholed. And he was correct. Uh -huh. Well, it's too, it's so funny because I was just watching the Toni Morrison documentary the, again. I watch it a lot actually. Like, and there's one part where they read a review of Sula and it's like, if she keeps confining herself to the African-American experience, she'll be pigeonholed. But but that is a true thing because I, I, I'm i working, my next book takes place partially on campus. I was saying this in the 90s. And I have a, a scene where she's talking to her professor. She's studying art history and she's a Latina girl studying art history. I was the only person in my entire department. And I was the only Latina in the art and art history department. Wow. And I only one of three people of color in both departments, like and so at the time. And I have a quote where he says, if you keep, want to be identified, you, he said, you could get a reputation as just being in, in the tent because of identity politics, or you could be legitimate, right? Like, and it, these are exactly, things people really is, said. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, I think it takes a lot of conviction. I mean, just thinking about leadership, it does take a lot of courage of conviction, I think, to stick by something and and not you know hear those things and not be wilted by them you know like it's very um it's easy as a younger person to hear something like that and get completely 
twist it around, right? Like, and it's like it's something that you didn't. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Easy. Um, so is this part of imposter syndrome? The idea that if somebody says something like this to you, you then think, gee, maybe I shouldn't write about what I wanted to. Maybe I should like you to the, to the norm. Um, I, yes. I think so. I think, you know, I remember it's funny. Like I'm, I, it's when I think about my undergraduate experience and again, it's, it's hard. Like when I had imposter syndrome or in, in times, like it was also such a different time. Like uh, it was the mid nineties. And I, I decided, I remember I was actually kind of ostracized by my own community because they were trying to get everybody to major in ethnic studies. Like oh everyone <laughs> so that they could have enough people in the department. Yes, yes. Like, no, you know, like, no, otherwise we're not going to be able to get this department. And I was like, but I want to study art. Like, this is like, I, I knew I wanted to do that. And, and at the same time, everything didn't fit in. Like, it's like, like everybody studying art and art history at that time was very like, well, first of all, half, most of the college was coming from North New England prep schools. Yes. And, you yes. know, looked like they came out of a J. Crew catalog in the 90s. And I think there's still a lot of that. <laughs> there's right still now. a lot of that. There is still a lot of that. And so a lot of it was feeling like I quite literally didn't fit in because like from a, a class aesthetic, like so many things not quite fitting in. And and I think I wasted a lot of time and didn't get to know a lot of people like because of that, because I very much isolated myself. Like I sort of kept my head down and did my work. And I decided consciously <laughs> when I got, and also there was so much around affirmative action at that time where people were like, well, you got, you took somebody else's slot. You know, like that was another thing that was said was that. all the time where it's like, well, you got in because this other person didn't get in. And there was never any acknowledgement for the fact that this other person might have had a head start on a starting line in a different way. And, and that I had had done all this other kind of work to make up that distance. And, and I do think that that ruined it for me in some ways, like it was like a voice that nagged in my head. Um, and then 20 years later, when I came to Iowa, I remembered reading Alex Chi's um oh, collection of essays and wild. he talks about yeah and he talks about that a little bit happening at Iowa and I was like I am not going to do this this time like I'm going to decide that I like I'm there because I deserve to be there and I'm not going to think about it again <laughs> that's, that's that is the healthy thing to do because that otherwise you spend time and effort um doing other things you know I remember what your first year going to your apartment when you had us over after class and you had moved like all kinds of interesting things from your from your Brooklyn life yes. to Iowa City, and I felt like, oh, she's really consciously moved here. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was it was so nice. It was very nice. It was that was the best semester. I mean, and it was also just <laughs> I was, that very... was before you sold your book. Yes, yeah, that's right. So it was, was better very... before. Was it better before you sold your book and all this stuff started happening? Was I mean, like the outside world. Before. I miss I miss that time. Yeah. Before. This is um, what people say. They all say that they missed the time before they became like. Yeah. Well, you know, to go to, to the point of leadership, I do think I just read this wonderful New Yorker pro interview with uh, Min Jin Lee. Did you did uh -huh. you read it? I haven't had a chance to see it. It's that. really wonderful. But she at one point she says, I never intended to be like the super Asian writer. Like she's like, but like I like she's like, but I feel that there's a I'm a I'm serving a purpose as like a voice. And I think I wanted to write about what I wanted to write about. And I'm very happy to be here for my community. But like it is, it does set like it feels like everything feels heavier now, if that makes sense. Like it's like like yes. it's not just carrying a load. Yeah. And people are noticing and watching because there just aren't enough people you know <laughs> like, and so and, I think that's what that's one huge <laughs> aspect of being a leader you yes. are carrying a load for other people yes you, you are, are carrying a load for other people you become you know part of who they are yes they give that to you yes and I think like it's like I think that that's right and I think you are always moving, I think to go back to that thing, it's like you're moving in consideration of others also. Like, it's like, how do you go forward, but in consideration of, of others? And so I definitely, what was nice about that, that semester, that first semester before anything sold or anything happened, it was just literally, you were kind of just able to be there with your art and like- Yeah, and that's the idea. Yeah, and it's just so, 
fabulous. And it's like literally, it's like an ease, you know, because I had had my own business before and it was sort of like, it was this really cool respite. Like, and as a lead, like, I think I had like, I worked at Hunter and I was in charge of like 15 people. And then prior to that, I had like 10 part-time employees at my com- at my company. And it was like, almost like I got like a break from adulting was how I felt like it was like, and it was yeah. so cool to get that rest and that respite. And I, I don't know, maybe I like, I'm naturally inclined to be a little bossy or leadery because like, I feel like I keep finding myself back in that sort of position. <laughs> No, I was thinking you were there for a semester. It was your apartment. You were the person who invited everybody over out of all your classmates. And then you sold your books super early. And that was when the time ended. I mean, I often think that, um, that the purpose of the workshop is to give people this incubator time. But I feel like you had sort of accidentally maybe pushed yourself out of it a little bit before yeah a lot of other people a little yeah and I do it was funny because it completely coincided with COVID so it was like I think about it being um a perfect time like it's like I I I, it does feel very precious because it sold I think two weeks before everything went into lockdown yeah and so um you know we'd gone out for Margo I was in Margo's workshop that second semester and we'd gone out and like that was like the last normal thing like and and um but there was something so nice about what, well, I will say, I think this, and I feel that you are this way also. It's, it is interesting. I think leadership also requires a certain amount of like conviction, uh, you know, like, and, 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 um, well, I think that's what we were saying of like, I'm not going to listen to you. Right. Like, yeah, I, no, I knew that he was wrong. You need, and he was wrong. He but- was well-meaning. I could see that and I could understand his point, but ultimately I knew that I would never be able to follow his advice. Yeah. And then, so I ended up sort of taking it, you know, taking it on the chin or, or sort of getting what he told me I would get yeah. for years. Yeah. It was very interesting. Yeah. That is interesting. It's interesting, but also it makes me feel like something that you had said to us in the novel workshop, which was like, it's only going to be like, only, you know, what it's supposed to be. Like we, you can get feedback, but only, you know, what it's supposed to be. And I think it is funny because I think the same kind of quality that can make for good leadership actually makes for at least good novel writing. (laughs) It's it's this inner conviction. It's an inner conviction. There's also a vision. Yes. There's a vision, like a big picture. And there's a willingness to sort of persist or persevere. Did, I did mean, you think about during COVID when you had to do all this work basically from- Oh my your, gosh. It was, so, yeah. And you're like, so, um, well, and you're alone, actually. You are very you were very alone. And so I think it's it, it was a very, um, you really just had to keep listening to yourself. Like keep listening to yourself. That's right. Yeah, That's you were right. just completely listening to yourself. And I think it what's a cool part, by the way, just about the workshop is like, it does, now that I'm in a different, I'm not in a workshop at all, and I'm working on a second book, I have been shocked at how good I am at listening to my gut instinct. Like, it did, like, refine that. I did send to a couple of my reader friends that I made at workshop, but like, I'm, I I feel, I'm surprised at how, how my compass, my compass is pretty clear and and easy to read relatively. Um, And that got honed, I think, for sure, in that time yeah yeah no i think that really happens so i have a question for you and this is about work-life balance oh okay i feel like we both have a lot to say about work-life balance yeah you've been just inundated with like success in many fields multiple fields since your book sold you know just you were like directing your own tv pilot you know casting it doing all this stuff writing this script doing other screenwriting things I, for many years, since maybe, yeah, when my daughter was born in 2007, I've been parenting, directing the program and writing. So I feel like we both have something to say about trying to get achieve balance. Do you feel that you actually seek balance? You know, I don't (laughs) know. It's funny. What I will say is like, I really... I feel like I was like phoning life in when my grandparents were aging, if that makes sense. Like that was a very hard, like I was, you know, kind of, I was really just running my business. And like, I just, I wasn't, 
emotionally engaged in that life because I was very involved in like, I was very involved in like my private life, which is like my family, my, my parents essentially aging. And now I think I feel so grateful to be doing something that I really love that I was very afraid to do. Right. Like I, I sort of didn't think this was like a viable path at all that I don't know that I have any balance. Like I sort of like I set reminders to like call my friends and check in on them. And, like you know, like it's like, don't forget so and so's mom had like foot surgery, you know, like it's wow. like, okay. like I, I, I sort of tried like to make me not completely get like, but if I especially when we were doing the show, the TV adaptation stuff, I was drown, I was drowning in work, but not necessarily actually in a pleasant way. Cause it was sort of, um, some parts of it were fun, but it was getting further and further from the thing that I really love, which is writing, you know, like, but like if I have a day and I know that I can do that, I don't, to me, that feels like balance because I'm very happy. And like, and I, <laughs> I don't know, like it doesn't make me feel, um, it doesn't make me feel like I'm pulled away from something, but I do have to make a point to like, I have to make a point to put attention to my personal life. Um, I'm not good at, I'm not good at giving that other stuff, stuff, the energy that it needs to. Can I interject? Can I interject? People want to know more about what TV pilot you're working on. Oh, sure. I'm so sorry. So I, I, I sold the book like February 26th. And then on March 11th, I was taking my readers, my two, my first readers um, to dinner to celebrate. And it was the night before everything in New York locked down. And I got a call from, at that point, it was Hulu that they wanted to option the book. And so I, um, and I was like, well, I only want to do it if I'm going to write it. And so then I came on as a co-executive producer. I will say that is also a great thing about doing things older. Like I just felt very confident that nobody could do it better than me. <laughs> And so even though I'd never written a screenplay before at all, I just sort of decided, well, actually, what I'd said to my agents at first, they were like, it'll be easier to sell it if you're not attached because you've never written a screenplay before. And I was like, well, it's 10 a.m. in L.A. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, it's 10 a.m. in L.A. If by six o'clock you can find me another New York and middle aged girl from Brooklyn that could write this, I was like, then I'll bow out. And like two hours later, they were like, we're just going to go out with you attached as a writer. And I was like, okay, great. And then like a week after that, I got this offer from Hulu. And so I spent a lot of the pandemic revising Olga, like from sale to packaging. There's so many rounds of revisions with the novel. Uh, uh, Sam knows this, but like for people that are not in that, in that space, um, revising. And then I was also writing the pilot script and then, um, I think in March of last year, we got the green light that they were going to shoot the pilot. And so we started casting and doing pre-production and hiring people to do scenic design and costume design and like just this whole thing. And so we shot the pilot like in the summer and fall and we're editing it through the winter and it's going not be on Hulu. It's not soap opera enough for Hulu. <laughs> it's going to it's going to end up somewhere else, and we're trying to figure out where in the Disney verse it's going to be. But like we are, um, we're it was very. I mean, it was very challenging. But I think the other thing is like I actually like screenwriting. I think it, the funny part is is that it was you know one of the things that people don't tell you in life or don't want to give credit to is that um, your past experiences. I do give you so much knowledge to take to other experiences and people don't seem to give credit for transferable skills. And so, you know, we would sit in these meetings with these TV executives and they would be like, you know, you don't, are you overwhelmed? You've never done this before. And I was kind of like, it's sort of just like a big wedding. Like, you know, like it felt yeah, yeah, like yeah. I had a wedding plan. It was just like, I was like, it's kind of just a big wedding. There's a lot of chaotic things happening. It's a bit of a circus, like, and you're literally the executive producer. You're like, okay, this needs to happen first. We can't do this until that happens. Get, take money away from here and put it to here. And it wasn't, it didn't feel challenging as much as it felt like I had been very happy. Like one of the happiest times of my life was in my little apartment on Jefferson street, like staring, looking at the Catholic church parking lot, like we're working on Olga. And it just was that was a great church. Oh, it's a great church. But like, it was like, it's just, it was as far from that as I could get, which is like being surrounded by 200 people for 15 hours a day, like, and you know, being asked to make micro decisions every three minutes. So it wasn't that I didn't, couldn't do it. It's that I didn't love it as much. <laughs> it's 
like what I realized. And it wasn't the writing. It was the like actual process of it. The truth of the matter is I will be doing this for as long as the show goes on, but like, and that's okay. Like, cause I want to me, I mean, that's another thing I guess about leadership. Like it's just, they're just, it's a very original viewpoint of seeing Latinx characters because they transverse broad worlds. They transverse different class spaces and different ed and different educational spaces. And it feels very important to me that that get as big of an audience as it can. And I don't, because there is such a lack of diversity in Hollywood and particularly even within the diversity of Lat Latinx communities, there, I, without my involvement, I just don't think it would get done well. <laughs> So I am like, I'm sort of like in this place, but that is grueling and you lose your life with that kind of that job because it's like my, my family and friends are all normal people for lack of a better word. And so you would work, your days would start at 6am on Monday and go to like 8pm that on Monday, but by the weekend, your days would start at 4pm and go into like five in the morning you know, cause like the day gets longer and later every day. And so my friends, like they're in bed by 10, like their kids go to bed at nine o'clock. They're in bed by 10 or 10 30. So it was really, we were just on completely different. Um, I was pulled out of my life for a, a long chunk of this last year. And that was very disorienting to me. So I feel like I'm trying to find work-life balance again, I guess. I, I actually think that the idea of work-life balance is overrated. Yeah. I think that might be true. I think it's overrated because I don't, I mean, I don't think it's possible to be completely balanced at all times. Like what works for me is doing one thing a ton for a period of time. Yes. Like right now it's promoting my book yep. and then switching to the next thing. Yeah. I can handle like maybe one other background thing at the, you know, at that time. Yeah. Like my daughter has been part of my life since 2007 and she's really awesome. She, you know, she is. She's, she's now in high awesome. school, but I mean, she's like the other thing I can do. So, yeah. when, I mean, I, I took a leave from teaching for the first half of the semester so that I could promote my book. I knew I yeah. wouldn't be able to teach and promote my books. Yeah. Like after I had tie, I applied for a Guggenheim fellowship so that I could write another book, but I knew I wouldn't be able to write the book, have tie, be yeah. married and have my job at the same time. Yeah. Like I just sort of gave up, like I made conscious decisions not to do X, Y, and Z so that I could get A, B, and C done. And then when right. that was done, I switched back to doing the other thing. Like um, when that's this is all over, I feel like I'll be teaching and directing in a more active way. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I just know that uh, that's great it's impossible that to do too many things at once. No, it's true. And it's great that you give yourself permission for that. But like, I'm actually thinking about it in hindsight. And I remember... I think this last year I felt slightly out of control of it because it was so much new and so much, but I remember when I decided I wanted to write, like that was like when I was like 40 and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to Breadloaf, but that means I need to produce material to apply to Breadloaf. Apply to Breadloaf, yeah. And then it's like, and then you're like, okay. And then after Breadloaf, I had this writing group and then I was like, well, I'm gonna apply to graduate school now, I have to produce me. And I, I remember saying to myself, well, I got a regular job. I sold my business because I was like, you can't run a business and have creative space. And so I got a regular job. And then I, I just remember saying I had had a breakup right prior to that. And I was like, I just don't think this is the time to date. Like, I don't think I have the energy to do like, like exactly. if I'm going to try to do this, I don't have the energy to do that. And, and exactly. so I do, I think I was more aware of the fact that I couldn't do everything then. And like, now it sort of feels a little bit more I haven't been, thank you for reminding me to be forgiving to myself and that I can't do everything. All yeah, all. you should just, you know, make a decision about what you don't want to do right now and yeah. then don't do it. And then don't do it and know that there will, but also know that there will be a season when you can do it again. Right. Yes. 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 Things yes. are definitely secular. Yes. I did forgive myself. I will say I did forgive myself when we were very into the show. I knew I wasn't going to work on this novel. Does that make sense? Like, I, was I like, remember that. Way. I remember you telling me, I mean, there was a novel you were working on and I remember you saying, I'm not working on that. No, I just, I had to, I had to not kill my, like, you know, I think that there's this thing where you're like, if you don't do something every single day, you're going to give up on it. And it's like, I don't, I think I know myself well enough to know I'm not going to give up on anything. It just, it's a matter of like yeah. timing. Yeah. 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 I just am very bad at multitasking actually. And so for me, it really helps me to put one thing aside. Like right yeah. now, I'm not trying to write at all. I'm giving yeah. myself three to 12 months where I'm just not going to write because I just underwent that 
horrific experience of having like a private project, you know, oh, hacked out yeah. of you and made public. Yes. I felt like someone had reached into my mouth, grabbed my stomach and pulled it out of my pulled stomach. Out. And then you're, and you're also <laughs> supposed to be very cheerful while you talk about oh, it. Oh, totally. No. <laughs> Wait. It's, I mean, but it is great. I mean, it okay, is so great. big picture. Like, yes. I think that's really important to any sense of leadership is the big picture. It is great. Yes. It's just that on a sort of granular level, it involves a lot of, you know, awkwardness or feeling anxious, you know, that kind of thing. But on yeah. a big picture level, if you can see it, it it's is amazing. Great. Yeah, it's amazing. I do think, I think it's so good. I, I always envy that you are not on social media. I, I it's know. definitely. <laughs> I, I mean, but no, it's good to be on social media when you have something like a book coming out, but yeah. it does take up a lot of time. It, it takes up time, but it's also sometimes makes it more, on the one hand, more vulnerable. And on the other hand, like about the thing of leadership, like you're more manicured, if that makes sense. Like you feel like you must be a little bit more, more manicured. And, um, and then I like, you know, I think even just things like talking about the transition and deciding to come to graduate school and stuff, like it, you realize that people are looking at it and you're you you are leading like you're telling the story you know like I I was doing um uh like an online book club kind of thing you know like and and the woman was like you know and you I'd always wanted to write but you know now it's too late and I said I was like it's not like we're the same age I was like it's literally not uh, <laughs> like and so you realize like that you are also kind of giving messaging if that makes it like it's not just talking it's kind of messaging and it's that. not just about you this is what yeah. LinkedIn means yeah She's right. a spokesperson for creative Korean American experience and yes that's exactly it position. yeah and she the position and that is definitely I think when I read that I was like I completely understand and so I I do feel cognizant of that I just not that you asked but just because it might be helpful to the people like I know one of the things that people were talking about was how do you get the courage to do the thing that you want to do and so I'm curious because you came to this younger and like and you were a first generation like first generation American I just am so curious where you got that gumption to do because so many people feel that they have to go into like a, a professional right. field you know right. like it's like yeah I definitely didn't have the gumption to do something like this at that I, age. I just always knew I wanted to be a writer like since I was four I knew that's what I wanted to do and wow. until I was able to do it I always felt like an imposter in my life if that wow happened. yeah until I started writing that the things happened that made my life make sense. For one, I stopped having student loans because I, because writing ironically um, was okay. Right. <laughs> you know, I was able to sort of teach rhetoric when I was here, which supported my time here. And yeah. I just started to slowly become solvent. And then after I sold my book, I was finally able to pay back my student loans, which were huge, huge. because I had stupidly gone to professional school to please my parents that I didn't really want to do. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, I just always wanted to do this. And at some point in my mid 20s, which felt late to me, I suddenly came, I just woke up one morning and thought I cannot live my life unless I'm doing what I care about. And that's one of the things I think really has made it possible for me to have my job because yeah. I'm not by nature, you know, like a, a sort of one of those forward facing, like <laughs> outward facing kind of, you know, shouldering the story of everybody, people. What yeah. really mattered was I wanted to give people, a, you know, from everywhere, um, the opportunity to pursue their dreams. I wanted them yeah. to support them. I wanted to make it possible for them to have a decent time here. Yeah. Um, I wanted to create a community where people felt supported. And you know, it's it's not always perfect, but on the big picture level, I feel that I am doing a job that I genuinely care about. Yeah. So we talk about, you know, creating narratives that Latinx people from all over the, you know, from all over the country can relate to or yeah. at least watch yeah. or see or read. Um, that's really important to you. And that's where the urge, I think, to be sort of any kind of leader comes from. I think that that's right. I think it's for me. Yeah, I no, no, that. no. I think that that's right. I think I weirdly suffered from like being competent at a bunch of things. Like, yes, <laughs> yes, you, you're very good at a lot of things. I, and I think it took me a while 
to, well, first I will say, like, I think I, I, you know, I, I was raised by much older people because I was raised by my grandparents. And I think I wanted to do something, things that made sense to them, if that makes sense. Like, it's like, you know, I, and so um, I just had a series of paths that like they understood. And I think it was, and I was good at them. And so, you know, you sort of get like, well, and people would say, I remember saying to somebody once, I was like, I don't want to plan weddings anymore. And they're like, but you're excellent at it. And I was really excellent at it. And it was a very good business. And, and I was like, I know, but that doesn't mean that I have to keep doing it. Like there's, and I didn't, I don't know. I'd always wanted to write. And I, I will say that that actually was the number one thing that I was intimidated out of in college because my, my college roommate had won the 17 magazine fiction writing contest. Oh my God. And had gone to bread loaf and like, and I was like, and I sort of got there and I was like, well, you can, I guess only one of us can do this. That's going to, that's her thing. And I've got to find my own thing. No, but it's not a zero sum game. No, I know. At that age, is, there's room for a lot of people. room for everything. It's so, yeah. and it's so, it's funny. And now she's had a career as a journalist and she's just coming back to writing fiction. Oh, wow. now. It's that's really wild. wild. And partly that's because wild. I came to do it. Like she was like, I got, now that you're doing it, I, I want to go back and, and go back to doing this. So, you know, it's been sort of, that's been kind of beautiful, but I think that I finally got to be the age to, I, I, I think I said this to you once, like just when we were kind of talking and when I was in Iowa, it's like, I almost had to raise myself. Like if I would have had a kid at 21, like I, that kid yeah. had the nerve to go and be a writer. And I, I needed to become that person and have a whole life to have the, the courage to not be afraid to listen to my own my own inner instinct, you know, and um, sure. and try something. But if you remember when I got there, I had a very like I sort of was like I, I want to finish this book. I hope I can sell it, and then I'd like to get a job in publishing. You know, like I sort of oh totally. You want to be that? Yes. You'd be awesome. But but exactly, <laughs> it's another thing you'd be good at. I mean, in in my case, I was just listening to you thinking. In my case, I think I had to go through a lot professionally and do the things I wanted to do before I was able to have a family. Yeah, like I, I didn't actually get married until I was 39. And, yeah. Um, and then I had one child. I, I never did imagine having a lot of children, honestly, but I couldn't imagine having children at all until I had finished like the professional things. At least a, I, I couldn't wait. It wasn't just one book. It was two books. I was that yeah. anxious about sort of giving away the life that I had struggled so hard to. Well, I think there is something the weird, the second book makes you feel like you're really doing it. The first book feels not like a fluke, but like, you're like, I don't know. It's weird. I definitely, I, I sort of get that. I, I think. No, when, you, when you have two books out, tell me, check, check in again. And tell I'll me check in because then I'll say yeah. it's not two, it's three. I mean, like, so <laughs> many writers I know go through this thing where they're like, at, between every book, they question the whole thing. Yeah, really yeah. Do. yeah, because yeah. it's so hard to start a new book, but it sounds like you're well on your way with your second book. And I'm kind of in love with it, even though it's oh, very so cool. cool. It's gut, gut oh. wrenching, but I'm in love with it. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. I mean, but how I, are you doing that and promoting your first book, which just came out like I, at the beginning of this that's year? That's been hard because, as you know, it's a different you're performing, yeah, in some way, and so it's a little bit hard. I think totally different. I think I've tried to pare it down a little bit, the promote, the promotion and like, and I, I went away, I had to leave Brooklyn because I couldn't deal with, you know, seeing my goddaughter and this and that and the promoting and trying to write, like I had to kind of remove myself for a, about a, a month to just get it on its own track, if that makes sense. And now I'm sort of in a place where I can put in time every day. And then at the, like in another couple of, in another couple of months, I've blocked everything out so that I can just, isolate kind of again um and I think that, that like and, and and then I get make more progress but I'm feeling proud of it and I think it's funny because you start to see the great part about writing is like you always know that you're going to keep getting there's always room for improvement if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It's different from something like being a violinist where you stand up, you do it on stage and that was it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's right. Like, it's like, there's always room for improvement and it's on the one hand, it's, it's cool to see it comes out. It's coming out better and more organically. And a lot of things that were like craft lessons, you know, I remember going in and I was like, Margo said, we should have people in action and revising the novel to put yes, people yes. <laughs> and now it's like in me. And I'm like, it yeah, just yeah. happens organically. And you're like, and it'll keep getting better. So that's kind of the nice thing about it. So, but, but it is very hard to toggle 
and I think, um, and I think to, I, I do feel like it's like from one moment to the next, I, it does feel like I've become like a personality in the Latin, Latinx community and space in that like readers and writers. So that's been big, you know what I mean? Like big. And I yes. think the time, um, the time away and I'm going off social for the summer. So I'm excited about that. I already planned yeah, it. That's great. Yeah. That's I've already great. planned it. And I do think that is something that, you know, is another thing that's important. And I know you just came, come back from Germany, but like these times when you can just sort of you do need to recharge like that is whatever that whatever that looks like for you like you do need to recharge i would never have written my novel without the help of resident artist residencies yeah. which i would made it you know my husband has been the most patient wonderful person he 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 takes care of Ty while I'm at the residency. Then I come back and I try to do a really good job with Ty. Um, <laughs> we try to take turns a little bit. Um, but it's been it's been so important for me to get away. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess this is part of this theory of mine that you can't do everything at everything once. Everything at once. I yeah. think that that's a smarter way to think about it than feel like you're failing all the time. That's right. No, <laughs> exactly. Because it's impossible. I see Chewie's back. Will yeah, I? would you be oh, willing cool. to have a, uh, take a couple questions from the audience? Yeah, totally. So one, um, Sam, you mentioned briefly about change in the Iowa Writers Workshop. And so there was a question about, was there any resistance to change or what was your experience with that? I mean, nobody's, nobody told me they were resisting. I think everyone was happy to welcome <laughs> like many voices to the program. That was my feeling. I I mean, it was slow at first. Um, the real thing is to encourage people to apply mm -hmm. um, because so many writers who live in sort of cities in other parts of the country are scared to come to the Midwest. I mean, I don't know if you felt that at all. You seemed pretty sort of determined was, and careful about it. But I was very scared. Frightened though. I was, well, I was frightened to leave, not the, of the Midwest, but I was frightened to leave my life, you know, like, yeah, yeah. But yes, I think I mean, you're right. It's the encouragement for sure. Yeah, I remember Justin Torres was so nervous about coming here. He was persuaded to come by a lot of alumni in New York, but he wrote me saying, I'm queer and Latinx and I don't really know if I'm going to feel comfortable in a place like Iowa. And then he, he came out here with his roommate, Ayana Mathis. That's oh. how that's how Ayana found out about the program because she she said, I'll be your roommate. I'm curious and also I can work from home. So it doesn't matter if I stay in New York for a while. Oh, wow. Isn't that Oh, wild? wow. That's like, wild. Yeah. That's very cool. Mm. Yeah. But I think that, I think it was, it was, it took some, some, gosh, I don't know. I think we're always in a, in a position where we're changing and, and there's always something a little bit like that, that that we're working on or thinking about, but there was no like active resistance at all. Great, thank you. Um, here's another one. This is from um, a graduate student and she uh, asks, um, <clears throat> do you have any advice? Um, how do you become more comfortable and confident taking up space as a leader? Ooh, that's good. Hmm. That's, no, that's a good one. Um, you know, I think that it, for me, it takes a certain amount of, of self-talk, if that makes sense. Like, you know, and I think, and remembering what you're there for, you know, it just is like, this is not exactly leadership, but like, I remember coming to Iowa and it was like the first week. Um, and I was in Sam's novel workshop and no one wants to go first, right? Like, like, yes. it's, like who yes. wants to go? And it's through the whole first. novel workshop. And I, I sort of had this moment and I felt awkward. You know, I wanted to say like, I was like significantly older than a lot of the other students in the program. And like, and I was like, oh, I, like, how am I gonna make friends and blah, blah, blah. And I just was sort of like, you are here because you wanna write this novel. Like, why would you take not take the chance to get feedback right away? Like, then you'll have the whole semester to work and on the that's feedback. that's what happened. And you that is what happened. the whole semester revising your book and then you sold it right at the beginning right of the Right at the semester. beginning of the second semester. So that's like- wild. Like, but like, I want to just say like, it's not like, so to me, it's like, that's a small moment where like, I could have shrunk because I'm trying to figure out how to fit in. And there were a lot of second years in that class. And let me let one of them go first. And it was like, there was hesitancy on the part of everybody else. And I was like, well, I'm here for this purpose. And that is like, I'm going to assert myself in this moment. And I think that it's the, why are you in that 
why are you there? And remembering why you're there always gives me the source of confidence to take up space, you know, like, and I think that that is um, probably the easiest answer that I could give to that. That's the big picture question. Why am I here? Yeah. Like, I'm here because this in the yes. big picture. Not and then it gets, pushes you past that moment of like wanting to shrink, like when you might want to shrink, like it forces you to assert yourself, I think. I mean, I think this is, a, this question is the answer. It, it's a tricky question for me because I'm the third out of four um, mm -hmm. sisters and I've always been the one who's sort of like watching everyone else instead of stepping up in a lot of ways. And so I think that I've tried to create a leadership style in which I do not like put myself front and center all the time. And yeah. that works best for me. And I feel like the point is not about me. The yeah. point is like, how are things working and changing in the program? Like, how is the program doing? Yeah. Um, how are the students doing? I don't have to take up a ton of space in order to do a lot of my job, which, you know, for me has really turned into a project of making the program the kind of community I want it to be, yeah. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also brings up the idea of like leading at from any level, like you don't have to be. And in, in a style that, that, that suits you, right? Like right. I think in a style that suits you and that, that there are different ways. I actually was thinking about how you have such an interesting leadership style, Sam, and like, and how it is very empowering because it creates space, like, but it creates space for you to realize that you can be self-sufficient. You know what I mean? Like, and it's like, I can find readers, I can find mentors, like, you know, I can find these things if I go looking for them. Because the, the program has always been that way. The program has always been large enough so that students can find each other. It has not been about people telling other people, well, I guess my predecessor, Frank Conroy, was a bit like, you need to do this and this in order to write well. You need yeah. to sit down for three hours every morning. Do not make an exception yeah. or you will, you know. But um, but I think that he also backed off big time more than I do in terms of the community. Yeah. Like, it's really about people making friends, which yeah. then become their readers. Yes. And their literary friends in the world, which, you know, and it's interesting because in the writing world, um, there, there, you do need friends. You need you people you can bounce ideas off of, or people who can just understand what you're doing to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the workshop has always been about the peer group. And one of the reasons it's such a strong place is because the peer group is so strong. So one of the biggest things I do for my job is to find people to come to the program, you know, to choose, choose applicants to come here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think there are a lot of different styles and that, and that one of the key things that I think works for developing people with the ability to go into the world is that they have to have a chance to um, try things out, like to work on their own, I don't know how to describe it, their own style, either in the classroom by teaching undergrads or among their classmates. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things about writing is it's such an individual career. You do have to take charge of it to a certain extent. You do mm -hmm. have to steer your life. Mm -hmm. It's weird. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think you are really well suited for that, partly because you came to the program when you were grown up. I yeah. Mean, you. Yes. And you're just sort of adapting. You kind of know what things work for you and don't work for you. I think that yes. that's like, and what things you're willing to do and not willing to do. And I think you also, I, you know, I think you listen to yourself and listen to your gut a little bit more and like, this feels good or this feels bad. And I think, you know, I think that's a, another thing that like, weirdly about taking up space is like, I think sometimes you're not necessarily being shrunk if you don't have, like, if you're not a, like the loudest voice in the room, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're being shrunk. It's like, you feel when you're being shrunk, like you can have that feel like you're like, I'm not giving, being given the the space or the, the, like, I definitely had the, I came to understand the difference quite a lot in this last year, because like there were times when I felt like I don't need to assert myself now in this creative process or on the show. And then there were other times where I was like, I am being told I'm not valid, even though nobody was saying it, I could feel the difference. Yeah. And so you sort of have to learn to like read the room and like, and be like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to push back against that because it's not appropriate, you know, like, and I, I do think 
I don't know, for me, I got better at that when I started, and not to advocate for too much stuff, but like I started meditating when I was like 30. And like, I did definitely get much, much better at understanding my own instincts um, after that. Like it, it just helped me get rid of a lot of clutter. That's so interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Any other questions, Will? Yeah. Um I don't know. Should we are we should we are we kind of at time here or what's the plan? Should we ask one more question? Let's go ahead, just because this is this is an amazing conversation and it's so so great. Um let's do one more and then we can go ahead and go into the raffle for the people that can stick around. But yeah. Okay, so this is kind of like a fun question. Um the real question is what are you reading right now? Oh, I am reading Arinze's collection. Oh, my that's great. Classmate Arinze's collection, who's a year older than me, and it's going to come out in a couple of months, I think. Um, and it's coming out off of, um, oh my goodness, a, 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 it's the literary magazine, Sam. Do you remember who he's publishing, getting published? Oh, public Space. Public yeah, Space. And public then I'm space. reading an unpublished book that I'm very excited about. She's actually a Chinese American writer and um, I, I was asked to blurb it. And so I'm oh, reading nice. two unpublished books and I, I and I actually don't know that that title, I think the title is a work in progress, but I'm reading uh, two books that aren't published yet, which is kind of, I, you know, it's really funny. That was my favorite part about being at the workshop was getting to read things that I'm like, oh, it's so like far in advance, like that I'm getting the inside scoop. And so it's kind of fun because now I still get a lot of books that aren't quite out yet. <laughs> Yeah, it's like you get to see what's coming, like yeah. what the changes are going to be right before, maybe from, in my case, when I'm looking at admissions applications. That's right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm reading this book, Mouth to Mouth by Antoine Wilson. Oh, I heard it's amazing. Yeah. He's a workshop grad um, and he lives in LA and he's, it's been, or at least he was in LA when I just saw him, um, but it's, it's been, it's really great. It's great. And there's so many books coming out by people who just recently graduated. I know. There is Social's book um, that came out, Liz Weiss's book, um, yep. uh, Mark book. Prince, Belinda yes. Chang. Um, there's going to be this book by Lee Cole, which I think just just came out. And I think it's going to be like all over the place. Yeah. Yes. Um, but there are just so many books. Who else is? And Arinze. And, Arinze's um, book. Um, Ada Chang's book. Ada Zeng's book is coming out, and I think um, Santiago's book. Oh, is Santiago out. Sanchez. Santiago Sanchez's um, book is coming out. Um, it's a big year. It's a big that is year. A huge number. Um, and books. then just you know, a, a general two books that I'm just excited to see come out in the world. Um, my old workshop, uh, she was my New York workshop person. Clavis Natera's book is coming out in May, and then. Um, this guy, Jonathan Escoffrey, who I taught, I taught a bunch of his stories and it's like, it's it, his novel is coming out in September from um, FSG. And I'm really excited about it because like I've been reading it in phases, like we were at Breadloaf together and then I, at another workshop together. So I'm excited to kind of see that out in the world. It's just some really cool, 2022 is a beautiful year for books and diverse, beautiful books, like, which yes. is nice, yeah. Great. That's a great way to end. Now everyone has some some a list of books they should read. And actually, someone was asking if there's a, a list of the workshop books. Is that somewhere? Every, oh. every you know, Leah would have it. Leah, oh, a librarian. Yeah. Um, she keeps a list of workshop books. So uh, I think you'd have to email her. Okay. Well, we'll we'll follow up. I see the person who's asking it, so we'll uh, follow up. Um, and now, yeah, I just want to say thank you both so much for your time today. This was um, a great conversation. It was it was great to hear you both speak. Um, and now, I think Chewy, we're going to draw some books so that uh, there will be five. I think we have five copies of Olga Dies Dreaming and five of The Family Child. Yay. So get awesome. some books out. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. This is such um, a pleasure. It was so great to talk to you. I know. Oh my goodness. So great. It's so great. I missed our conversations in Iowa. So it's even yeah. nice. Um, and thank you for having us. Thanks so much. It was a real pleasure. Bye. Bye.